The fact remains. Job chapter 19. Then. This is the third class in Brother Neville's series, Hast Thou Considered My Servant Job, entitled The Complaint of Job, Brother Neville. Well, thanks, Brother Stan. Well, brothers and sisters, we've uh, really got into the argument of Job, I suppose you'd say by now. Remember, we looked at the conversation, the two major conversations between Yahweh and Satan in chapters 1 and 2. And now we've looked at the arguments of the friends themselves, how those, the arguments of the friends were both, in some ways, different to each other, but in many ways the same as each other. So they complemented each other very well in their false understanding of the uh, situation that Job found himself in regarding the real reason for his suffering. This evening, we're going to look at Job himself. So I'm going to pretty much stay in this section here, but now look at it, the whole thing from Job's point of view, because well, the interesting thing is that, you know, we made the point in our last study, it wasn't actually that difficult for Job to defeat the friends in argument. I mean, all he had to prove was that the righteous aren't always blessed and the wicked don't always suffer. As soon as he could prove that, then he could disprove the argument of exact retribution and he could overturn the friends. And the question then arises, well, why does it take 20-something chapters for him to do that? When it appears, and certainly once he starts to do it seriously, it only takes a chapter or two and he's pretty much demolished them completely. Well, the answer is, of course, that it took Job that long to develop his own argument. He could have demolished the friends that quickly. But their continual prodding and their continual persecution of him on this issue meant that Job himself started to think a little bit outside of himself. And what you're going to find is that Job, in fact, develops a whole argument against God here. And once he's got his argument against God developed, that is, once he's clear on his position with God, then he turns all guns on the friends and wipes them out in a couple of chapters. Now, he could have done that in chapter 6, but he was far too preoccupied with why was God doing this to him, and and how was he going to, where was all this going to end? What was the purpose of it all between him and God? And the friend's continual prodding made him keep thinking about his own relationship with God, and once that was clear, then he just wiped out the friends in an instant. And, And it's remarkable to see this happen, and in fact quite dramatic by the time you get to where Job finally arrives at. So the point is that even though the friends made no real progress in their argument, and they just went round and round in circles for 20-odd chapters, or their share of them, Job made substantial progress. There is a clear progression in Job's thought throughout all of these chapters. He does not go round and round in circles like they do. Now, we just read chapter 19, and there's a remarkable thing about chapter 19. Well, there's a, there's a number of remarkable things, but I, I draw your attention to something here in chapter 19, in verse 23. By the time you get to chapter 19, Job has got his argument or his, uh, the, the, his relationship with God completely squared away. He knows what the next step has to be. And you've got an example of that in verse 23 of chapter 19. He says here, Oh, that my words were, were now written in a book, or now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. Now, what Job's saying here is that, well, the first point is, oh, that my words were now written. He's got some answers, you see. Things have now come together in Job's mind, and he knows how he wants to confront God on the issue of his, what, what appears to be unjust suffering. And it's time to start putting ink on the page. That's what he says in verse 23. But then he goes to verse 24 and says, no, no, you are even better than that. I want my words chiseled into rock, and the cavity of the rock filled with lead. That's what he means here in verse, 20, in verse 24. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. So chisel out the words with an iron pen and then fill the cavity with lead so that the words never ever perish. I mean, if you simply write them in a book or in a scroll here as it is in verse 23, the words might be lost. Job's complaint might be lost. He says, no, no, I want it immortalised. My complaint against God for what's happening to me. Never let anyone ever forget the words of Job. 
Well, of course, these words have been memorialized, and it didn't take a rock to do it. It, it is immortalized in, in Scripture, of course. But do you know what? I, I think by the end of chapter 42, if Job could have deleted anything he said, these two lines here would have been the first couple to go. By the end of chapter 42, Job will be wishing he had never said what he has said here in chapter 19. But the fact remains, you see, there's a lesson here. There's an enormous lesson here, and this is one of the great lessons of the book of Job. And we're going to begin in a moment in chapter 6, which is where Job starts his argument, which of course is his first reply to Eliphaz's first speech. But before I get there, I'm going to have to show you a few more details about the character of Job. And the reason for that is because what Job's going to say here might surprise you, and in many ways it might alarm you that anybody could say what he says. If, for example, if you, you or I were to say what Job gets to say here, every ecclesia in the world would call, us, call it blasphemy. There's, there's just no question. But this is Job we're talking about. And you've got to understand uh, just how Job is different to us in this. Now you come with me to chapter 27. You'll see here, chapter 27 is down here. These are the monologues. So chapters 27 to 31 are the chapters that Job speaks by himself to God. They're like soliloquies. Uh, Great speeches Job gives, almost like rhetorical speeches, spoken in an audience of men, but spoken to heaven as it were, not asking for a reply, not expecting a reply, just laments or, or comments that he makes. And in chapter 27... Well, chapter 26, Job has answered Bildad, so the, here, he's answered Bildad, so the, the, the argument with the three friends is finished by chapter 26. In chapter 27, his monologues begin. And he continues speaking, this is the point, he continues speaking even after he has defeated the friends in argument. And he, he gives two speeches, and you'll see them here. You see in verse 1 of chapter 27, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, and then in verse, uh, chapter 29, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, you see in chapters 27 and 28 are the first monologue, chapters 29 to 31 are the second monologue of Job. These two protests, or protests, these pleas, these, these cries of injustice that Job makes after the conclusion of a debate. And it's interesting, you know, to notice the if I put up, this is the summary of these monologues. So here's chapters 27 and 28, the first monologue. Here's chapters 29 to 31, the second monologue. And you can see the content of the information that Job runs through in these two monologues. So the first one, he summarises the debate. He denies his wickedness. He says, that in fact, the friends are, are more wicked than him. And then he talks about the fate of the wicked so the friends can see themselves in that picture. So he replies to Patat somewhat in chapter 27. And, but then he says, but you know what? All these things are happening to me, and I don't know why. And if God doesn't answer my prayer in a very obvious manner, how can any of us really find out why these things happen to us? So where can man find wisdom? How, how can man possibly find wisdom? It's difficult to understand what God's doing. This is his point. In his second monologue, then in chapter 29, completely in chapter 29, he reflects on how things were in the past. What things were like for him in the past. Chapter 30, what things are like now. Chapter 31, his character. This is like a curriculum vitae, like a resume of Job's character in Job chapter 31. Which I might say, I don't know, how many of us could put text beside... This is, this is, this is unbeatable. Unbelievable character of this man. Well, the first observation you might make about that is Look how the focus changes. So chapter 27, he focuses somewhat on his accusers, on the three friends. Chapter 28, where's the focus? On God. Chapter 29, 30, 31, where's the focus? On himself. So you see, Job in fact gets a little more introspective, almost as if he's becoming more and more internal looking as the speaking continues. So interesting observation just in these monologues. But look at chapter 29 and consider Job's relationship with God before all of these calamities came upon him. Look at this. Here's here's the summary in chapter 29 of Job's relationship with God before the trial. Verse 1. He continues his parable and says, Oh, that I were 
as in months past and in the days when God preserved me. When his candle shined upon my head and when by his light I walked through darkness. So God's the light of my life, he says. Every step I took was on the basis of the word. I mean, there's no, there's no ambiguity there. This is an extremely faithful and committed brother describing his relationship with the God he loves. Verse 4. As I was in the days of my youth when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. Here's the New International Version. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime. When God's intimate friendship blessed my house. I mean, look at that relationship. He's got an intimate friendship with God, he says. When, verse 5, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, he says. So there's the measure of the model family and the truth, you see. There's nothing wrong there. You come across the page to verse 18. I mean, chapter, chapter 29 goes on and on in this vein. Verse 18 of chapter 29, Then I said, Job says, I shall die in my nest, I shall multiply my days as the sand, my root was spread out by the waters, dew lay all night upon my branch, my glory was fresh in me, and my bow was renewed in my hand. So this is, this is the security that Job had in his own future. Like a great tree, with an enormous canopy over it, roots reaching out this way and that way. What he's saying here is he expects a long life, grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren. The family would never wither, he says in verse 19. His honour and strength would never fade, verse 20. But when you come to chapter 30, everything's changed. Look, verse 1. But now, those that are younger than I deride me. Verse 9. And now, I'm their song. Verse 16. And now, my soul is poured out upon me. You see, everything's changed. And worst of all, verse 20, chapter 30, verse 20. I cry unto thee, God, thou dost not hear me. I stand up, and thou regardest me not. Thou art become cruel to me with thy strong hand. Thou opposest thyself against me. The intimate friendship that we used to have is gone. It's been ruptured. New International Version again here. I cry out to you, O God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly with the might of your hand. You attack me. I mean, this is an upset man, brothers and sisters. Yet look at what I'm like, he says. Chapter 31, verse 1. I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Moral purity. Like, like impeccable model moral purity. Verse 5. If I have walked with vanity, or if my foot has hasted to defeat, let me be weighed in an even balance. Ruthless honesty all his life. Verse 9. If my heart has been deceived by a woman, if I've laid it wait by my neighbour's door. Unmixed fidelity. Verse 13. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or of my maidservant when they contended with me. Impeccable justice. Verse 16. If I've withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail. Unfailing compassion. And you can read the list. You see, here it is here. There's no idolatry whatsoever in his life. No revenge and complete integrity in everything Job has done. I mean, he just hasn't done things wrong, like we might do them wrong. He just hasn't done the kind of sins we've done. Not that he hasn't sinned. But he's prepared to go into print before God on what his life is like. And as long as Job's wrestling with these problems, he just doesn't do these sins. He just doesn't think like the most of mankind thinks. Not, as I say, not, not just that he's tried to avoid wickedness, he just has never done these things. Now this is not legalism, brothers and sisters. This is a clean conscience before God. This is an immaculate conscience. He, this is the outrage that Job feels there because of the suffering he's undergoing. This is what he was like. This, this just is what this brother is like. Probably the greatest man, as I say, living in the world at this time. This is Job. This is the servant of God. You've got to bear that in mind. Now, you come back to chapter 6. So ne- never forget the calibre of this man as we start to now read what under some duress and anxiety he now starts to say. 
All right, so Eliphaz has opened the debate, the debate in chapters 4 and 5. Job's going to now have his opening words in chapter 6. Eliphaz has said that Job's got something to answer for, that there are secret sins that he's not confessing. Well, Job's very hurt by that. And in chapter 6 and verse 14, he comes back. To him, he says, Eliphaz, to him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. But he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. What kind of friend are you, Eliphaz, he says. Anyone who doesn't show pity in a situation like this forsakes the fear of God. You carry on like that, you might have something to answer for yourself. You think, I've got something to answer. Carry on like this, the tables might turn, Eliphaz. So Job immediately goes off on the front foot and he's, he's angry at being treated like this by his friends. But you see, now he's begun to think about the problem. He's hurt by his friend. He's hurt by God. And as he often does in debate, the debate, you know, he answers the friends and then he just prays to God in the middle of a chapter, like chapter 7. In the middle of a chapter, he just prays to God and then returns to answering his friends. And so you read these words in chapter 7 and verse 17. Job says, publicly to God, chapter 7, verse 17, What is man that thou shouldst magnify him? And that thou should set thy heart upon him, he says. Here's the RSV. What is man that thou dost make so much of him? That thou dost set thy mind upon him, dost visit him every morning and test him every moment. You see, he's frustrated. That that God, that that this agony that he's going through just has no let up. And and he doesn't know why and how long it's going to go. All he knows is that any time soon he's going to die. Verse 20. I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou preserver of men? Why hast thou set me as a mark against thee, so that I'm a burden to myself, he says. Now, there's a bit of a poor translation in verse 20. Listen to this from the RSV. If I sin, what do I do to thee, thou watcher of men? Or as Moffat says, O thou spy upon mankind? I mean, these are, these are pretty strong words between a, a brother and his God, you know. If I have sinned, verse 21, he says, why don't you just forgive me? Why don't don't you just forgive me if I've sinned? Why do I have to keep suffering like this? Because the way we're going, he says to God in verse 21, you'll kill me. You'll, You'll just kill me. And if I die, then when you look for me again, I won't be there. Is that what you want, God? Is that what you want, just to kill me? What about our infinite, intimate friendship? You see how upset he is? He doesn't know what he's done to deserve this suffering, and he simply warns God that God could be making a big mistake that he might regret later. Now, you might think you'd never ever say this. This is where Job's up to, though, you see. Brothers and sisters, these are, the, these are the agonized words of a desperate man. It's easy for us to be critical. He's lost his wealth. He's lost his children. He's lost his servants. He's lost his health. He's sitting out there beside a fire, scratching himself, ostracized from his community, completely disfigured by disease, which is going to take his life any minute, a shadow of the man he once was. And it appears from verse 3 of this chapter that it's only been a matter of months, a short time, since all of this ordeal began. He's hardly had time to come to terms with things himself. You can see Job wrestling with this situation. Nothing seems to make sense to him. Well, Bildad replies in, 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 in chapter 8, this rat tat tat of this, this high-powered lawyer comes in against him and, and, and no emotion, no compassion, no understanding, just blasts out this you know, incomparable justice of God that Job should be able to understand that. If your children are dead, Job, it's because they've sinned. Get over it. Oh, says Job, chapter 9, verse 2. Oh, he says, I know it is so of a truth but how should man be just with God? I know, but he, I know that nobody can claim to be pure alongside God. Bill Dad, I understand that. But when you talk about justice, when you talk about the justice of God, Bill Dad, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Look at verse 17, bottom of your page there. Because God breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. There just doesn't seem to be any reason for what's happening to me. And of course, you know, this is the whole problem, isn't it? These friends all assume that Job is suffering as a punishment for some sin that he's done. But it wasn't. What was the reason for Job's suffering? It was as a result of a conversation that Job had with Satan, that God had with Satan, rather, back in the first couple of chapters. 
And do you remember, remember how the discussion went between God and Satan? That after Satan had destroyed Job's wealth and his servants and his children, that Satan appears before Yahweh again in chapter 2, verse 3. Do you remember what God said to Satan? He said to him, Ah, Job still has he considered my servant Job, none like him all the earth, upright and so forth. And uh, Job still holds fast his integrity, though thou movest me against him without cause. That's exactly what Job says here, you see, in verse 17. All this is happening to me without cause. Well, that was true. If viewed from Job's point of view, that was true. God was not punishing Job. If viewed as a punishment for sin, Job was right. The suffering was without cause, except that Satan had asked for it. That was the only cause that Job was suffering for. Well, of course, Job is looking for a cause. He's looking for a reason behind the suffering he's enduring. He doesn't know about the conversation with Satan. So he draws the obvious conclusion over the page. Chapter 9, verse 22. It's not fair. It's not fair. Verse 22. This is one thing, therefore I said it. God destroys the perfect with the wicked, he says. It's not fair. God's not just. Bill Dad, you talk about the justice of God. Well, I've got a big problem understanding that. God destroys the righteous with the wicked. Show me your definition of justice. In fact, Job goes even further, verse 24. In fact, he says, The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. God covers the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where? And who is he? It blames God for all the injustice in the earth. God just, just he does, God doesn't stop bad things happening to good people. He doesn't stop corruption. So not only does he, does he punish the righteous when he should be punishing the wicked, he allows wickedness to prosper. So let's talk about the justice of God, Bildad. You can see this is, a, a, you can imagine this being a pretty animated discussion. When you start putting together what these people are saying to each other and the context in which they're saying it, very heated, very emotional, very animated. But Joe's determined, you see, he's very convinced about his own righteousness. He's so convinced that he'd be vindicated before God, but he knows that God's too powerful to argue with. He knows he could never stand before God and talk to God like he's talking to Bildad. Look at verse 32, chapter 9, verse 32. For God is not a man, as I am, that I should answer him, and that we should come together in judgment. You see, the problem is that God's not a man. I can't argue with God as if he were a man. He would just overwhelm me. I already know that, says Job. You see, I've got a problem here. Verse 33. Neither is there any daysman between us that might lay his hand upon us both. What we need is a daysman, or an arbiter, an umpire, someone that can mediate between us. But no such person exists. So what can I do? What can I do? I've got a complaint. I could never take it to God. So I need somebody in between us because I, can't, I clearly can't front God face to face. He'd just destroy me. But look how competent he is. Look at verse 34. Let him take his rod away from me and let not his fear terrify me. Uh, but if God didn't destroy me, if God didn't just overwhelm me in an instant, well then I would speak and not fear him. Uh, but it's impossible. It's not so with me. It, it can't happen, he says. Ah, but you see what he's beginning to say. He's got two requests here in verse 34. The first request is, let God take away his rod from me. Stop punishing me. I mean, I can, he can probably hardly think straight with the pain he's in. So let God stop punishing me for a moment. And secondly, don't terrify me. Don't overwhelm me. If God would do that, then I could present my case. But now a new idea emerges. Now you can imagine what the friends think of this. They're getting furious with this. A new idea emerges. Chapter 10, verse 8. Thy hands, he says to God, thy hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. So you've created me, God, he says, but you're going to kill me. All right? Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay. Wilt thou bring me into dust again? Have you created me just to destroy me, he says to God? Is this all there is to life? Perhaps you don't care that I try and live a righteous life. Perhaps you don't care at all. But he reconsiders. 
So in comes Zophar, as you've seen, in chapter 11. Job reconsiders. Chapter 13, verse 15. Zophar spits out this first piece of invective in chapter 11 and Job uh, sort of wash, that, that washes over Job and back he comes in chapter 13 verse 15 well he says though God slay me yet will I trust in him but I will maintain my own ways before him he says alright he says well let's say God does kill me well even if he does kill me I'll still trust him you see there's, a, there's an idea beginning to form here God must be true to his own righteousness. If I know anything about the character of God, says Job, he has got justice, he has got integrity. And if, if it appears to me at this point in time that there is not justice with God, that, that things aren't adding up as they should, the day is going to come when it, it all pans out. Something must be done. God can't carry on like that. It would violate his own character to be unjust. So he starts to think about this from God's point of view, you see. Even if I can't find, uh, fathom all God's deeds, Job says, God's character won't change. Somehow, how, there must be a way for me to defend myself against God. Well, as it says at the end of verse 15, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Your margin says, I will prove, I will argue my own ways before him. And I'm confident of that, he says. Look at verse 18. Behold now. I've ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. This is amazing. He's extremely confident. I know what I'm going to say to God, he says, when I take him to task about how, this, how, how I've been treated. But I need two things first. I, need, I still need these two things, verse 20. Only do not two things unto me, and then will I not hide myself from thee. Verse 21. With, number one, withdraw thy hand far from me. Number two, let not thy dread make me afraid. Number one, stop punishing me. Number two, don't overwhelm me. If we can address that, if God just doesn't destroy me on the spot, then verse 22, then call thou and I will answer, or let me speak and answer thou me. You speak first and I'll answer you, God, or I'll speak first and you answer me. Whichever you like. But, if, if, but don't destroy me. And we can have this conversation. Oh, but I understand if you're too angry to talk to me now. I understand if I've done something to upset you. Chapter 14, verse 13. Look what he says. Chapter 14, verse 13. Oh, that thou wouldst hide me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me secret until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldst appoint me a set time and remember me, Bury me, he says, all right, so, so, so just kill me, bury me, and then raise me up at a time in the future when it suits you better. Verse 15, then thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thy hands. On a better day, you might feel differently about me, he says to God. And so you can appreciate the friends are going, uh, giving him broadsides of this argument about the sins he must have committed Job's re- he's really not paying that much attention. I mean, he, he gives them the dignity of an answer and then carries on thinking this whole problem through himself. You see, at this point, he's not attempting to, to defend himself against the friends. He's laughing it off somewhat. I mean, let's not pretend it doesn't hurt him what they say. Let's not pretend, you know, when, when they say, well, this is what happens to the wicked. Their children die, they, they get robbed of everything, they break out in terrible skin diseases, and, you know, obviously that would have hurt him. But he's not trying to combat that at this point. He's trying to get his relationship with God sorted out first. And since death is now a certainty, he says, look at this, chapter 16, verse 18. O earth, he says, chapter 16, verse 18, O earth, cover not thou my blood. Let my cry have no place. What does that mean? New International Version. O earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest, he says. Now that's interesting. He thinks his blood's going... What's this in relation to? Well, this is is a reference to Abel, whose blood cried from the ground. You remember? In Genesis chapter 4. He thinks his blood is going to cry from the ground like Abel. So if God does kill him, until resurrection comes, his blood is going to cry for justice from the ground. That's what he says. 
that Abel was killed unjustly. This is how Job sees himself. But who, who was it that's uh, who, who is it that's murdering Job? Well, look at verse eleven. God hath delivered me to the ungodly. Turned me over to the hands of the wicked, he says. I was at ease, but he's broken me asunder. He's also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. I mean, Job feels like God's gone by the neck and is shaking him. And set him up as a target to fire arrows at. His archers compass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. I mean, look at the agony that the man's in. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant, he says. Verse 17, And not for any injustice in mine hands. Also my prayer is pure. What have I done to deserve this? But you see what he's saying? God's killing me. Well, he's killing me and I'm innocent. Let my blood cry from the ground. My case can never be closed, you see. Because to to die in innocence as though I'm judged guilty is against all equity. And it can't be allowed to remain that way. You think about what Job's really saying, though. You think about the seriousness of this allegation. Who was it that killed Abel? Well, it was Cain. And who, who is it that's killing Job? Well, it's God. So he's paralleled God with Cain. He's saying God's doing to me exactly what Cain did to Abel. And my blood will cry no less from the ground because of that than Abel's did because of what Cain did to him. You see? So he's pretty upset. He's pretty emotional about this whole thing. But, you you know, the interesting thing is you you just look at how much greater God's understanding of all this is than man's. Look Look at verse 17. Job says... Not for any injustice in my hands. Even my prayer is pure, he says. Look at what your marginal reference says by that why of verse 17. Isaiah 53. You see, God's doing something with Job, which at this point Job doesn't even understand. He is an unwilling Messiah. There's no question. It is the just suffering for the unjust. There's no question Job hasn't got there yet. He doesn't understand that yet, you see. And God's got a far, far bigger perspective on this whole issue than simply Job's suffering. Or or simply Job's understanding of his own suffering, you see. Job didn't die, you know. Job thinks he's going to die here. He doesn't actually die. But there was another man that did die. And God did kill him. And he did suffer like Job. But unless he had died, the Lord, I mean, Job's righteousness, so-called, would perish with him. He'd never ever see the light of day, except for that man that died. So who, who are we to question the wisdom of God in our lives, brothers and sisters? You, you look at things that happen to you, and you can't make them all add up. How do you really know what God's objective is? And you can see, we look at it from a great distance of thousands of years, and we can see where we know how it all ends up, and we can see Job in the midst of it. Job's sitting in the midst of it, and he cannot see light at the end of the tunnel. And he's a faithful man, and he, you know, he's going back and forth across his own Bible, of which he knows a considerable portion, and he can't make any sense of this. But straight away in your margin, the translators are telling you, there's a bigger point here. But at this point, Job doesn't understand that, you see. And it's the same with us. We just don't know enough about the purpose of God. But of course, all this only brings us to the next problem. When Job is raised... Who will be a witness to his innocence? I mean, look at verse 20. The friends are going to be of no help. Look, my friends, he says in verse 20 of chapter 16, will they scorn me, but my eye pours out tears unto God. So he says, well, my friends will be of no help. Well, there's only one choice. I mean, who is it? I say that I'm, I say that I'm righteous. I say that I'm pure. What corroborating evidence have I got? Well, the people are around me, but now they spit at me. My own, even the three, don't trust me. Oh, my, my best friend, my family, where are they? Uh, who, will witness, who will witness for me? Who, who will vindicate me? Who will help me defend myself against God? Verse 19, only one choice. Also, now behold, my witness is in heaven. My record is on high. God's going to have to be honest. God himself is going to have to be my witness. The RSV here. 
He that vouches for me is on high. So that on the one hand, you see God is his enemy who's killing him. And on the other hand, God's going to have to be his witness to save him. No matter how you look at it, it forces God to argue with God. This is where Job's got to, you see. And Job is, if you you like, he's fleeing from God the destroyer into the arms of God the vindicator. And the remarkable thing about this is that despite his anguish, he knows God will be true to his character and be honest in defending him. So that even if God does kill him, even if God does punish him unjustly, Job knows that God's character can't change. Justice must prevail. And God, therefore, will have to defend him at the end. But he knows that justice may not come in his lifetime. Verse 22. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. I'll die. Now, that's interesting, though, because we didn't read it, but you might like to note in chapter 10, verse 20, Job says, Are not my days few? So in chapter 10, it appears he had days to live. In chapter 16, it appears he's got years to live. Job's spirits are rising, you see. He started to get answers to the dilemma. He started to get more upbeat about this whole thing. And on that basis, we come now to chapter 19, which we read. Now, you look with me at 20, verse 25 of chapter 19. Now, these are words that you know well, but how well you know them, brothers and sisters. Chapter 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body... Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Look what he says. My Redeemer lives. In this context, his Redeemer is God. Because that's the witness of chapter 16, verse 19. That's who he thought his Redeemer was. Uh, But look at what Job says. Look Look what Job understands about the truth. He believes God will be his Redeemer because there is no mediator or friend to vouch for him. Secondly, he believes he'll be vindicated since he's suffered unjustly and he is righteous. So he believes that God's going to accept the fact that he really was righteous and he didn't deserve this punishment, as he thinks it currently is. Thirdly, he knows, or he believes at least, that he won't be vindicated in this life. And so he waits for the future. Fourth, true justice requires bodily presence. And since he's going to die and his body will be destroyed completely, he expects to be resurrected. Number five, he believes that judgment will be upon the earth. That's what it says in chapter 19 and verse 25. And number six, he believes that he'll see his Redeemer literally. I myself will see him with my own eyes, he said. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me, says a modern translation. So this is what Job understands of the resurrection, of the judgment, of the interview before God. This this is what he's put together. Quite remarkable, isn't it? So this is an enormous climax now of Job's understanding. God began as his creator. Then God was his enemy. Then God was his judge. Then God was his witness in chapter 16. Now, in chapter 19, God is his redeemer. And Job wants a public declaration that he's righteous. That's what he wants. That these things should not have happened to him. But there's one thing you've got to understand about these verses. As I say, the verses 25 and 26 are well-known verses. Of course, they appear in the oratory of the Messiah. What does the Messiah quote these verses to prove? Well, it quotes it to speak about the resurrection, to prove that the resurrection is going to come. But do you understand that that's actually... Well, misquote the verse, to misquote the verses in a sense. I mean, doctrinally, the verses certainly speak of the resurrection, yes. So the Messiah, I'm suggesting, quotes the verses correctly in a doctrinal sense, but incorrectly in a contextual sense. What's the reason that Job says these verses? Not because he wants resurrection, but because he wants justice, isn't it? He thinks God's going to be forced to vindicate him. The only reason resurrection comes up in these verses is that he thinks he's going to die in this lifetime. That the the, the disease is going to take him. Oh, yes, it might take years, but at this point, he can't see any other way that God's so upset with him, God will have to put him down and then bring him back out on a better day. That's the only purpose of the resurrection. The whole issue with the Redeemer here is that Job will be vindicated before God and he'll finally get his day in court and the justice he desires. 
So that God, who's de- clearly determined to crush him as he believes, would also have to be true to himself and must vindicate Job after his death if he truly was righteous. That if, that is, if Job truly was righteous. At which time, he'd then see God as a friend. So you see, that's really the point of these verses. Not, not resurrection at all. Resurrection is simply a means to an end. But having got to this point, you see, we've now reached a climax in Job's understanding. The friends are still slugging him. You see how far Job has moved on from the argument of the friends. They're still slugging him back and forth on this argument of exact retribution, the fate of the wicked, the justice of God. Job's left them way behind. And this is how the argument looks. This is, here's the entire argument of Job. And what we've... Well, this is Job's entire argument, really, through this, the whole section of chapters 6 through to 26. So he talks about, you know, he defends the fact that he's grieving. You know, even animals, when they're suffering, they grieve. They cry out. He talks about the failure and the ignorance of the friends, the false doctrine of his friends on this exact retribution question. That he's in fact innocent. He hasn't committed these sins that they have suggested he must have committed. That in fact the wicked do prosper, and therefore exact retribution is not true. God is all-powerful. Man, however, can't stand before God. So man needs an umpire. Who can explain God's treatment of man? So obviously he's going to die soon, but he still wants an audience with God. He established the basis for that audience, how that might, you know, the two things that he needs for God to do to uh, facilitate the audience. Um, But obviously God intends to destroy him, so he hopes for the resurrection. His suffering, God will have to have to finally be the advocate that Job needs, a last cry for justice, and then the resurrection. But this is this is the argument that Job makes. And we've got right down here now to chapter nineteen. In fact oh, there it is there, there's there's a little more detail on the exact these dots here are those verses. <laughs> So I've told you that I've broken it up into sections so you can see the exact verses I mean. We've just read the blue dots. We've just read all of those verses. That's the argument we've just gone through. And now we're up to chapter 21. And now he's going to just just completely destroy the friends in a couple of chapters. Not only sinners suffer. Exact retribution isn't true. I mean, he can demolish them in a very, very short time. But he doesn't, why don't you say, why why doesn't he demolish him back up here in chapter 6 and 7? Oh, because he's got to get this argument worked out. And then he comes back and he goes, boom! And he destroys the argument of exact retribution, but accepts the fact that he might have to die in a more or less short time. You see, this, this is Job's argument, you see? And that's why it happens like this. Well, of course, as I say, we've got to chapter 19. He's got to this, the, the, the uh, pinnacle, if you like, of his argument. Now he turns on the friends, and he's going to have to dispatch the friends. Here he goes, chapter 21. And look, it, it, just, it really doesn't take very long. Chapter 21, verse 1. Job answers and says, this is after Zophar's second and final speech for Zophar. Job answered and said, Hear diligently my speech. And let this be your consolations. Listen carefully to what I tell you, he says. Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I've spoken, mock on. And if what I'm going to say now doesn't convince you, it really doesn't matter to me. I've got all the answers I need. You see, Job Job is extremely confident in chapter 21. Verse 7. Wherefore do the wicked live? Become old, yea, a mighty in power. I don't see the suffering in their lives. Their seed is established in their sight with them. Their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. The wicked are in a pretty good position. Nothing goes wrong for them. If you haven't seen this, he says in, in verse 29 of this chapter, if you haven't observed that, then go and ask one of the travelling men. Go and ask somebody that's going to and from the earth. Go and ask somebody who's seen a bit of life. I'll tell you it's exactly how it is. It is not true that the wicked suffer all over the place for their wickedness. It's just not true. And if that's not true, then exact retribution isn't true either. I mean, he's, he's, oops. he's just dealt with this in a couple of verses. Well, chapter 23... Job's confidence is increasing. I think I gave it a tweak, sorry. (laughs) Job 
Joseph's, Joseph's confidence is increasing in chapter 23. He's answered his friends and now he wants to answer God. Verse 1, chapter 23. Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning, he says. Oh, that I knew where I might, might find God. That I might come even to his seat. You know what he says? I would order my cause before him. I'd fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words that he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Will he plead against me with his great power? Will he? Will he plead with me against with his great power? No, he won't. He'd put strength in me. You see what he says here? He doesn't think he's he now wants to have the debate immediately. He has to accept that he's gonna die at some point. He wants to have the debate with God before he dies. He wants to debate right now. Will God destroy me? Will he? No, he won't. He'll uphold me. Extremely confident is Job here in chapter 23. Now earlier he'd hesitated about challenging God. He said that a meeting with God would terrify him, would overwhelm him, that God would destroy him. He said he wanted two conditions. It's all gone now. Look at verse 10. Chapter 23, verse 10. He doesn't need these two conditions anymore. But God knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Let him test me, he says. Let him come and find me. Test me. I'll succeed. I will pass the test. But the problem is, of course, he doesn't know how to find God. He wants to have the debate. He wants to take God to task, but he can't find God. Verse 8, chapter 23, verse 8. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand, but I cannot see him, he says. I can't find God. I can't have the debate I want. That's what he says. Uh, But, you know... It won't happen in this life anyway. Because obviously God intends to destroy me, verse 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. The implication is, he's going to kill me. He's determined. I can't stop him from killing me. All I know, therefore, verse 17, is that darkness is coming. I want the debate now, but I can't, I can't, I, I, I can't take it to God. Darkness is coming. He's, I'm going to die. Now you put all that together. What has now happened in the three cycles of this debate? Because here we are, we're in chapter 23. We're pretty much at the end of the debates. Job protested against the sins alleged by his friends, maintaining his innocence and complaining to God about God's unjust treatment of him. As the friends are unable to offer assistance, Job turns to God for help. He wants an audience, but cannot appear himself. He looks for a mediator, but there is none. The situation is hopeless. He sinks to his lowest depth and longs for the resurrection. That's by the end of chapter 14. The second cycle, chapter 15 to 21, Job continues to hunt for answers. Since man is too weak to represent himself before God, God himself must represent man's case in order to achieve a fair judgment. In fact, his own character requires this. So even if Job dies now, God must resurrect him and vindicate him. Having established this, Job now turns his attention to disproving his friend's arguments. The third cycle, 22 to 26. Though he's made progress, Job now finds God incomprehensible, arbitrary, unjust, and a poor ruler of the world. He has won the debate but it's no closer to understanding the purpose of God with creation or the real reason for his suffering. So this is where Job's got to so far in this debate. So you can see, clearly you can see, brothers and sisters, I think, the enormous progression in Job's understanding. The friends are going round and round and round in circles. They keep bludgeoning him with this exact retribution argument, and Job just takes off. And when he's finally got to a position where he thinks he he can win his day in court with God, he demolishes the friends in a couple of chapters. That's why it takes so long. And this argument appears to go around in circles. It's not really going around in circles from Job's point of view, you see. Very interesting. Well, he's suffered a lot. He's lost his business. He's lost his money. He's lost his family. He's lost his health. He's been attacked by his friends. He feels like he's now been attacked by God. Satan said that Job would curse God when all of that happened. That he'd leave the truth. That he was living a righteous life only for the money. In fact, the reverse was true. 
When Job was tried, when he did lose everything, the one thing he would never relinquish, he says, is his own righteousness. God could take everything from him, his possessions, his wealth, his health, his family, everything. But God couldn't take away his character. He couldn't take his character. This was the greatest commodity Job owned, you see. And Satan was wrong. Satan was wrong. Not just wrong, but but I speak with respect. Job's going to say, even if God left the truth, I wouldn't. Even if God left the truth, I wouldn't, he says. That sounds ridiculous. You want me to prove that? You come with me to chapter 27. How else would you read this? Now I'm saying that's blasphemous for any one of us to say that. This is what Job says. Chapter 27, verse 2. This is the beginning of Job's monologues, Job's conclusion. This is the greatest strength and at the same time the greatest weakness of Job. Chapter 27, verse 2. As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. Even if God's unrighteous, verse 2, I will not be, verse 4. You see that? New International Version, verse 2. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made me taste bitterness of soul, my lips will not speak wickedness. Even if God stoops to that, I never would. He can take everything, but he can't take my character, he says. And he swears an oath on that, based on the injustice of God. Have you ever heard such a thing? Have you ever heard such a thing? This is is Job. That's why I turned those verses at the start of our address this evening. This is the servant of God. This is Job. This is a man par excellence. Look what he said. This is how strongly he feels, you see. And the friends, verse 5, God forbid that I should justify you, he says. Until I die, I would not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. I'll never ever admit you're right to the day I die. You'll never ever convince me of sin. I just haven't done the things you've accused me of. Well, the problem is... He's defeated his friends, that's fine. But now he's condemned God. Because he can't admit the possibility of his own imperfection. The fact is that Job doesn't know everything. He doesn't know the real reason for his suffering. There's no way God can let him find out. There's no way God could possibly reveal the discussion of chapter 1 and 2. There's no way Job Job can be allowed to find that out. That would ruin everything. That would completely ruin the trial of Job's character. Uh, But because of that, Job assumes there's some fault with God. Well, he begins the monologues with an oath in chapter 27 here. And he ends them with a declaration of his innocence. You come to chapter 31. These are the last words of Job before Elihu starts to speak. Chapter 31, verse 35. Look at this. Oh, he says, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written a book. What's that mean? What do you suppose Job is asking for here? Well, he wants to know what charges God's going to bring against him. He wants to know what he's done wrong. He wants to know the reason that God's punishing him because he still believes it's a punishment that he's undergoing. He wants to hear the indictment and he wants it written down. Verse 36, surely I would take that book upon my shoulder. I'd bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto God the number of my steps as a prince would I go near unto him. If such a thing existed, he says, if such a book existed, I'd wear it like a prince wears a crown. I'd wear that book as a badge of honour. Why? Because it would be blank. That's why. It'd be blank. You see what he's saying? This is the confidence of Job. Let's hear the charges. The book is empty. His confidence would contain no word of guilt about him whatsoever. He'd be glad to meet the charges, whatever they are, because they're non-existent. That's his point, you see. Now, why do you suppose he's asking for that? 
Why do you suppose he's asking for the book that God would write against him at judgment? Well, because he wants to stay in court. Oh, yes, yes. But that's not all. You see, he's got his own book. He's got his own book. You read about it in chapter 19. He wants those words memorialised. He wants them carved into the rock and filled with lead. And if those words in chapter 19 were carved into the rock and filled with lead, what do you suppose they'd look like, brothers and sisters? This is the court of heaven. Job versus God. The plaintiff has five charges. Number one. God acts in an arbitrary and a destructive manner. People, particularly the righteous, are destroyed for no reason. Number two, God is indifferent to wickedness. The wicked prosper without punishment. Number three, God is silent. The creation are subject to his will without understanding it. Number four, Job is a righteous man, but he's been treated as though he was unrighteous. God is unjust. Number five, Job requires vindication from God, public vindication. God must admit that Job is righteous. I think it's fair to say we've left the friends a long way behind. And even Satan really isn't in the game anymore, is he? This whole issue that arose with Satan, it's it's ancient history now. This is one of God's greatest servants ever, brothers and sisters. One of God's greatest servants ever. But you can see we've got a problem. We've got a really big problem. This is going to take some time to solve. God's going to have to get involved himself. That's why I looked at the quality of Job's character before all this began. This is unbelievable that a brother in the truth could have allegations like this against God and expect to win them in court. But that is what we've got to. And there's the proof. These are extremely serious allegations. And we've gone too far. And this is going to require, as I think you can see, an answer from heaven itself.